Hello everyone. Today I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to do a bit of physics. I noticed that a lot of the students that I tutor, when when they're given a lot to deal with, they panic. And panicking isn't the best way to handle tests. So a lot of the time students will panic when a question might have multiple, multiple objects in a system. And really all you have to do is just make your assumptions reasonable and use the relevant equations. Just take it very slowly, do one thing at a time and work generically. Don't plug in all the numbers at once. Work generically and slowly you will actually finish the problem and you'll work through it. And if you don't get it correct, your professor or teacher or TA, they'll be able to see the steps that you took and they'll be able to see and give partial marks depending on how correct your logic was. So let's do a problem that has multiple pulleys. That's right, multiple pulleys. Not the best drawn pulleys, but the I'm going to draw both of the boxes as the same size, which is a problem that you'll see many um, professors and TAs do because it, it's misleading to draw one box big and one box small. And if you see that on the exam, even if you see one box big and one box small, you can assume that unless you're given the actual number of like the actual masses of the boxes, you're just going to have to assume a direction, to be honest. A direction that they go in and then if you get a negative acceleration you know that you picked the wrong assumption but it's fine because it just means that it's in the opposite direction as what we set the coordinate system to be so we have this problem it has two pulleys one of the boxes is attached to to the pulley like so and the other one is wrapped like this we assume that the pulleys are frictionless and massless so far, we only have these two boxes in the system. How would you set them up? For now, let's call this one box one and box two. There's another masses, just are just labels. We want to set up free body diagrams. So for, let's do the second box because it's a little bit easier. It'll just be tension pointing upwards and gravity pointing downwards. So we know that in general, F equals MA. Well, the sum of masses equals MA, speaking generically. So here, and for now I'm going to call it M2A2 equals, because uh, masses of two, acceleration of two, we don't know if the accelerations are the same, and I'll show you why in a minute. But M, M2A2 equals T. Let's assume it's going up and down like so. You could do it the other way around if you wanted to m2g. That's an equation we have. What about the second box? This one's tricky. There's actually two tensions. One here, one here. So it's like, you know, tension, tension. So it's really 2t. And going down we have m1g. And we use the same equation as before. The sum of all forces is just ma. f equals ma. It's as simple as that. m1a1 equals 2t minus m1g. Now, if you haven't realized, t is always consistent throughout the rope. It's a continuous rope. That's the best explanation I can give. It's not going to suddenly vary somewhere else in the rope. It'll always be t. Like here's one string, so it's one t. Here it's two strings, so it's two t. We have actually a system of linear equations, but there's a little problem that we have. We have too many variables to solve for. Like, I'm, I'm solving this very generically, but even if you're given the masses and stuff, let's say you're given the masses, and usually you would be given the masses, you would have to solve for a2, a1, and t. That's three variables but two equations. If you have two equations, that means you can only solve for two variables at most. So we have to kind of link something together, and the best thing to link, actually, would be the accelerations. And this is a, a silly little trick, but you have to remember that the rope, the rope's length is finite. When this drops down by a certain amount, this has to go up by a certain amount, and it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. To think about it, the distance that it travels is actually, it's directly proportional to the acceleration. How? You can say in general that S, let's call S the length of a piece of string, it moves by one-half AT squared. 
you'll see that this is a one-to-one -one ratio between length and acceleration. So what does that exactly mean? It'll actually mean that a2 equals 2a1. You're thinking, what? But the best way to conceptualize this is that if you look at it, each time this goes down by one unit, this will go up by half a unit because it has to go up half and a half. So when you relate those kinds of lengths together, you'll see that this relationship exists. That A1 will have to be half of A2. So that's the relationship that goes for the A1 and A2. And you have now three equations and three variables you can solve for. Now you can solve for all of them. You can actually just plug this into these equations and just call it A in general, and you can just go off and solve it from there. So that's that's really the tricky part of this problem that you really have to catch. But if you didn't make that realization, you could still get a lot of marks by just doing these diagrams and showing your logic. If your teacher or TA is generous, you would probably get a lot of the marks from just making these equations because it shows that you understand the logic of solving these kinds of physics problems. So afterwards, yeah, you'll be given the masses and you just solve. Solve for A1, A2, and tension. And you'll have solved the system. You can experiment around with it. You can actually choose any masses you want. You can choose M1 to be big and M2 to be small. And you can see what direction the system goes to. You know, if M1 is big and M2 is small, that means that'll go down and that'll go up. And the opposite as well. You know, for this one, I guess I kind of assume that 2 is going down, so that would imply that 2 is kind of big and 1 is a little bit smaller. You'll have to make an assumption like that at the beginning for your coordinate system to begin the problem, but once you do that, you know, work it out and see what happens. If you chose the wrong direction, there's no need to worry. Just continue with the problem as usual. It won't. It'll just make some of the numbers a little bit... Po it'll make it like in, go in the opposite direction when you solve it in the end. But that's okay because the numbers themselves won't be different and it won't cause a big headache for your teacher unless unless you purposely choose something like like if it's obvious like two is big and one is small you know then you should probably choose what makes more sense but if they're about the same then like let's say they're about the same then you know you might have to just make an assumption and go along with it no one will blame you for doing that so yeah, that's the procedure you use to solve these kinds of physics problems. And you can extend it to more kinds of pulleys and more more systems, more 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 um, boxes. And if you do it with three, you can do this with three or four or very, very complicated pulley systems if you want. But this is just the underlying logic that you use. I hope you found this video helpful. If you found it helpful, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel so that you can be the first to receive all of the latest videos. Thank you.